today is my third Mother's Day here at Grace Baptist Church serving as the senior pastor. In the last two years, I tailored messages specifically to mothers. This year, I'm going to deviate from this pattern and actually take two Sundays, perhaps three, to encourage our moms. And I couldn't think of a better way to do that than to invite you moms to uh, draw near to God along with the rest of us. And um, during these strange days, specifically, what I want to do is look at the attributes of God, which we should really call the perfections of God, because each divine character trait um, dwells in Him in fullness. In other words, love, holiness, righteousness, and grace don't describe components of the divine essence, but rather um, the totality of it operating in complete harmony. For example, His perfect love is holy. His holiness is righteous. His righteousness is gracious. And His perfect grace is loving and so forth. And we cannot comprehend any of these apart from special revelation from God, the Word of God. And when people uh, go away from Scripture in order to try to define God, what they do is they invent gods according to their own fancies. Someone to suit their own needs. Someone that they can domesticate in order to feel better about themselves. The name of this is idolatry. Now thankfully, the true God has not concealed His nature, but rather in His Word, revealed it. And to the Bible we go today to conclude our parenthetical series that we're calling the 2020 Pandemic Through God's Eyes. And we have reached the climax, or the apex of the curve, to use an expression we have uh, grown to learn to, to be used to during these last months. But we're not going to flatten this one. We're going to camp here for a while. And figuratively speaking, like Moses, our faces are going to shine when we encounter the God uh, of the universe in His Word, and we will respond to Him accordingly. What I want to do today is focus on what theologians call the communicable attributes of God, the character traits of the divine nature that we can reproduce as people in a limited and qualified sense, because He made us in His image and in His likeness. And for the sake of precision and clarity, I'm going to outline today's message by taking the state of being verbs in the Bible, that to be verbs that describe God, and we're going to look at their predicate. And although a wonderful study, I'm going to exclude the metaphors for God, for example, the strong tower and a rock and so forth, just so that we can concentrate on the direct statements and for the sake of time, too. And uh, so, therefore, I could subtitle today's message simply, God is, because He is the great I Am who exists eternally in the present, who is, who was, and who is to come. But before we even approach this study, I need to tell you that I take the task at hand with a great amount of fear and trembling because I am a sinner and my sinful lips are trying to describe the Creator and Redeemer, my Creator and my Redeemer. His self-disclosure allows me to know Him truly but not fully comprehend Him or comprehend Him exhaustively. No one can do that. With that in mind, let's take a look at what he has revealed about himself in the Word of God. Let's look at a list of uh, God's perfections according to the Bible. We can say this, in the eternal present, God is spirit. That's the first one on our list. In the eternal present, God is spirit. And what I mean by that is exactly what Jesus meant by that in John 4 verse 24 when he was explaining true worship to the Samaritan woman. He said this, God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. What he means by that is that, contrary to people, God does not have a, man, a physical manifestation. Scripture ascribes sometimes body parts to God, maybe the hands of God, the feet of God, the eyes of God, and so forth. But these are anthropomorphisms, figures of speech, literary devices meant to help us understand His actions. So God is perfect spirit. And as perfect spirit. God is invisible. John confirms this in the, his gospel in the prologue. He says this, no one has seen God at any time. Therefore, church, nothing in nature represents accurately the divine essence. And that's the reason that graven images fall way short of representing God. And that's, we shouldn't be doing that anyway, praying to statutes and graven images. 
Thankfully, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has explained him, is what John says in John 1 verse 18, about Jesus Christ. In other words, if we want to know the Father, we must listen to the Son because no one comes to the Father but through the Son. And he and the Father are one, Jesus says. Now, God is perfect spirit. Now, on the other hand, you and I are imperfect spirit beings because we are limited by space and time. Here's how. Your spirit resides in a body that is headed towards the grave. If you don't, look, don't believe me, just look in the mirror. Compare that to a picture of you 10 years ago. Your body is going to the grave. And the day that your body ceases to function, your spirit will depart and live forever somewhere, depending on whether or not you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. So God created your spirit at one point in time, and that is your temporal limitation. Now, the same is true for angels. They are non-corporeal beings, meaning they don't have a body like you and I do, but they are limited by time. They have not existed from eternity past. Now, God, on the other hand, is not limited by space or time. That's what we mean by saying God is spirit. You cannot contain him in a body or a temple. And that is the reason why we shouldn't say the church is the house of God, because we cannot contain God in a temple. Furthermore, he doesn't have reference points like north, south, east, and west, like we will see when we talk about the omnipresence of God and his eternality. His is spiritual, spiritually perfect, and his spiritual perfection does not mean impersonality. What I mean by that is he's, he's not a force. The Holy Spirit is not a force. A lot of people refer to the Holy Spirit or think of the Holy Spirit as a force. But the Bible always refers to the Holy Spirit with personal pronouns, namely he. Now, and uh, because God is perfect and personal, let's look at some more of his uh, uh, perfections here that clarify that. Even though God is perfect spirit, he is a personal and perfect spirit. So we can say this, according to his self-disclosure, in the eternal present, God is not only spirit, God is love. And the Bible is clear about that. Instructing believers to love one another, John writes in 1 John 4 verse 8, The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And what he means by that is that not only God is very much identified with this perfection, he is the very source of love. Now, we misunderstand this divine attribute here when we reduce it to a feeling. Divine love has nothing to do with the feeling. And because we enjoy talking about God's love, sometimes we mistakenly create a hierarchy within the divine attributes of God or His perfections. And that hierarchy has love at the top and holiness at the bottom. And this is not biblical and leads to all kinds of problems and all kinds of heresies. For example, that's the reason you will hear... Even preachers say, oh, God loves you so much that he has your picture in his metaphorical wallet or on the door of his proverbial refrigerator. Maybe they don't realize this, but this illustration demotes the great I am to the boyfriend who's lost without you. And that is a heresy. Nothing can be further from the truth. And God demonstrates affection. That's not the case. God is the creator of emotion. God created affection and he loves us with divine affection. No doubt about that. But the popular romanticized view of divine love actually insults him. Because his perfect love has little to do with emotions. And everything to do with his own essence. God is love, the Bible says, which means He is loving. So here's how that works. I'll give you two examples. Because God loves, He gives. Because God loves, He gives. And we learned that from our favorite Bible verse that we like to memorize as soon as we become believers. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. He's talking about the world of people. God loves uh, the world uh, of people. And that, for that reason, he gave his only son to die on behalf of undeserving sinners. That is divine love. We love to talk about that. But here's the one we don't really like to talk about. Because God loves, he gives. But also because he loves, he must hate. Because God loves, he hates. Listen to Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. 
There are six things which the Lord hates. The Bible couldn't get any more clearer than this. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. So here's an example of things that God hates because He loves, because He is loving. But let me talk to you about the clearest demonstration of divine love or that divine perfection towards you and me. The Bible says this, God demonstrates his own love towards this and while we towards us and while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. In church that is one of the reasons we are to emulate him because he first loved us. John says in 1 John 4 verse 19, we only love because God first loved us. We are only able to love him back because he loves us. He first loved us. In fact, we're only able to love other people because God is the very source and the standard of this divine perfection. We just read here from uh, uh, 1 John that the one who loves who, who does not love does not know God because he's the source and the standard of this perfection. And he does expect us to reproduce that attribute towards other people and towards him, obviously. But here's what Paul says to the Corinthians as far as the definition of love. Again, Hollywood's definition of love has nothing to do with reality. It's not romantic. It's not a feeling. Love is not an emotional. It produces emotions, but it's not primarily an emotion. It's a decision you make. And here's the very clear definition of that attribute. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. But he begins by talking about this in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12 when he says, Let me demonstrate to you a more excellent way. Let me show you a more excellent way. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, he goes on to describe, Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. So here is the definition of how we should practice and demonstrate love not only to other people but towards God and again we're only able to do that because he first loved us he's the source and the standard of this divine perfection but let's look at the other one or or another one here in our list according to his self-disclosure in the eternal present God is not only spirit he is love and he is good. Now we're talking about the moral attributes of God here. Spirit is sort of an essential. That's what he is. And now we're talking about uh, spirit, uh, love and the fact that he is good. Now inviting people to worship, the psalmist writes in Psalm 135 verses 1 through 3, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. And the prophet Nahum says this in Nahum 1 verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. Now, And because God exists eternally in the present, His goodness never ceases. Even when suffering happens, for example, a global pandemic uh, followed by economic crisis or economic stresses. uh, stresses. Now, the presence of evil in the world does not diminish uh, His goodness. And people love to accuse God of that when they say, well, if God is good, then how come there's evil in the world? Friend, the presence of evil in the world actually highlights the goodness of God. For this following reason, Romans 8, 28, Paul says, All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. All things work together for the good good of those who love the Lord. Even when uh, he allows evil to happen or suffering to happen in your life and in my life. Everything is part of a divine plan working together for your good. Because God is good. Now the problem is we misunderstand this perfection often. When we attribute human goodness to God, which is usually (coughs) expressed like this. And and, and usually when God aligns uh, uh, his plans with our desires. And we say it normally like this. God is good because he gave me blank. 
which is not an untrue statement. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 11, Your Father who is in heaven will give what is good to those who ask Him. And we're encouraged to ask God because every good gift comes from God. Everything that is good comes from God. But if that's the only reason you can find to affirm His goodness, friend, you are missing the point. And you are missing out big time in your walk with God. You see, when you acknowledge this divine attribute because you understand His essence, even when He doesn't give you what you want, then you are on your way to spiritual maturity. And you can pray something like this, Lord, help me to take what you give and to lack what you withhold. And you can say those two things with the same degree of thankfulness because you are spiritually mature. You understand the goodness of God when He gives you things or when He doesn't give you things or when He allows evil to happen in your life or when He allows prosperity to happen in your life. Now, who are the beneficiaries of His goodness since we're talking about people? Psalm 23 verse 1 says, Israel, the people of Israel receive God's goodness. It says this, Israel and those who are pure in heart in Psalm 73 verse 1. Also, the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 24, tells us that those who wait for Him and those who seek Him receive God's goodness. Because every time you seek God, you will find Him. If you will uh, get to the Father through the Son, like Jesus says, that's the proper way of doing it. You will find Him every time. But also, David says that God lavishes His goodness on everybody. Because of Psalm 145, verse 9, he says, God is good to all. And His mercies are over all His works, meaning everyone in the world receives God's goodness. Those of us who are in Christ, we receive the elective love of God. We receive the the goodness of salvation, of course. But um, on a general sense, God allows the sun to shine on both Christians and non-Christians. He allows uh, the righteous and the unrighteous equally to breathe His air, uh, air. And most significantly, He made forgiveness of sins available to all. Scripture invites everyone to experience God's goodness. That's in uh, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But Jesus said in Mark 10, verse 18, that no one is good but God. Which doesn't mean that we are equally as evil as we can be. Remember, we talked about this last week. God restricts human behavior through government. So we're not equally as evil as we can be. What it means by that is that even though humans are capable of doing good deeds, we fall short of perfection. Because Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, no one is good enough to get to heaven. Although we are able to produce good deeds. In fact, in terms of salvation... Um, Our good deeds, our our good works are like filthy rags, according to Isaiah 64, verse 6, meaning they don't earn us any points with God. They are completely useless if we're using them to try to earn favor from God because salvation is by grace. Now, God is the source and standard of goodness. And we want to imitate Jesus for that reason. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be my imitators as I'm an imitator of Christ. And because we have received this divine attribute uh, of goodness, we want to show Christ to the world and demonstrate Christ's likeness to the world so that they can taste and see that God is good. And we have a great opportunity to do this in a time of crisis, in global crisis, to demonstrate to people that God is good by being Christ-like, by by showing what Jesus is like to them. So according to his self-disclosure, in the eternal present, God is not only spirit, God is love, And God is good. But fourthly here, we learn that God is faithful according to the Bible. Instructing the Corinthians, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, God is faithful through whom you are called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And what this divine perfection teaches us is that whatever God says comes to pass. Because He is a source of all truth. Well, we have an example of that in the very first page of the Bible. Genesis 1 verse 3 says that God said, let there be light. And nature responded by existing. He said, let there be light. And it was so. And then the rest of creation followed the same pattern, obeying the voice of the Creator. Why? Because everything He says comes to pass because He's the source of all truth. Now, um, and we will elaborate on that when we talk about His omnipotence, the the fact that He's all-powerful. And we'll do that next week. 
But here's how divine faithfulness is manifested to people. Let me give you the example of Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews. In Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, God made a promise, or a, a threefold promise, you should say, to him. And he says this, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and, I, uh, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the, ones who curse, the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And the Lord has fulfilled uh, this promise through Isaac and Jacob. Here's how. The people of Israel is a blessing to the world. The Jews are a blessing to the world, primarily because Christ came from that lineage in the flesh. And in Him, in Christ, all the families of the world are blessed because salvation is available in no one else, the Bible says, uh, uh, except in that one descendant of Abraham, Jesus Christ. Therefore, all the families of the earth are blessed because, uh, in Abraham because his descendant, Jesus Christ, died on a cross to save sinners. And also because uh, the people of Israel are the recipients of God's love and God has a purpose for them and some other promises are yet to be fulfilled to them. Furthermore, God has cursed everyone who attempted to annihilate Abraham's descendants through the line of Jacob. All you have to do is uh, read the, the history books to find that out. In fact, let me recommend the book of Esther from the Bible, and you will see that everyone who attempts to destroy the Jews is cursed by God. And yet, and they're, they're still going to receive uh, His faithfulness in the future. But likewise, my friend, God will fulfill Every promise that he made to you, you don't have to wonder about that. You don't have to doubt whether or not God is going to, prom to fulfill his promises to you. Now, the key here is to understand what kinds of promises he made to you and what kind of promises he has not made to you. For example, he has not promised to make you a great nation like he did to Abraham, nor has he promised to make you rich or wealthy and healthy. Now, why in the world would Jesus say, in this world you will have tribulation in John 16:33? Or, and uh, why would Paul say, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Jesus will be persecuted? 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 12. Now, here's what God has promised to you and me. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now, we already looked a couple weeks ago at the character of the evil one. He's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But the Bible says that he, God, will, prom will promise us to protect us from the evil one. And that's true even if you lose your life. And that is true even when he allows death to be a part of our experience, part of our family. Why? Because God is the source and the standard of all faithfulness. And he is the source of the standard of all goodness also. And therefore, we should reproduce this virtue in human version. Again, in a limited and qualified sense. Here's how. You cannot speak things into existence. You can try. Go to your room this afternoon and try to say, let there be light. And see what happens. Unless you flip the switch, nothing is going to happen. You are not able to create things just by words, just by uh, speaking things into existence. What we can do is to be faithful, is to speak the truth. In fact, the Bible encourages us to speak the truth at all times. Why? Because God is faithful, because God is the standard of all truth. In fact, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, um, you are able to tell the truth even when you think you're a chronic liar, you, even if you have lied in the past. And in fact, we are commanded to speak the truth even when the truth embarrasses us, even when it gets us into trouble. Therefore, we offend him every time we bake, break a promise. And those of you who, like me, are married, you made a promise to your spouse to love him or her and to st stick together until one of you dies. And you did that in the, in the presence of witnesses. So don't plan on breaking that promise. Plan on being faithful like God is faithful because you want to reproduce that attribute because you are made in his image and he expects you to do that. But let's talk about another uh, perfection of God. According to his self-disclosure, the Bible, not only God is spirit, he is love, he is good, and he's faithful, but God is also gracious. God is gracious. In a devotional prayer, David writes this in Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And he repeats the same doxological language in Psalm 145, verse 8. 
And here's what we understand how this divine perfection works. Divine grace inclines but does not obligate God to bestow benevolence on people. Let me repeat this. Divine grace inclines but does not obligate God to bestow benevolence on people. Nevertheless, He blessed, chose, predestined, and adopted believers in Christ on the basis of faith. According to the kind intention of His will, Paul says, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Ephesians 1, verses 5 through 6. Now, and what motivated God to do this? What motivates God to bestow benevolence on people? Remember, He's not obligated to, and yet He does it. Why? Because His nature is love and goodness and grace all at the same time. And not 25% each one of those, but all at the same time. Therefore, nothing other than His own nature... Nothing other than his own nature compels him to lavish kindness of people. I hate to tell you, but it's not because you are lovable that you receive God's kindness. Although we are created in his image, we are the object of his love. Nothing other than his own nature compels him to lavish kindness on people. Now, he does not need anyone. He does not need you. He doesn't need me. He does not need anyone or anything to complete him because he is the self-existing God. We we're going to talk about some of these other attributes next week. But God has not saved people in order to feel better about himself. We need to understand this. Again, remember, he is not the boyfriend who's desperate without you. No, that's not the right picture of God. He does not need, he does not need us. He, does not, he doesn't need anything to complete him. Now, and certainly he doesn't depend on your worship or mine in order to be God or even our reciprocal love in order to be God. Why? Because he's fully satisfied in himself. And the Bible is clear about that. He is fully satisfied in himself. He doesn't need anything. Yet, as recipients of divine favor, we believers have redemption and forgiveness of sins, and we have obtained an inheritance, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 1, verses 7, all the way through 13. We are placed in a new position in Christ, all because of His grace, not because of anything we can accomplish. Now, we don't deserve and certainly could not merit any one of these blessings. In fact, church, what we do deserve is this, judgment. We deserve eternal punishment, yet because... Again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, it is only by His grace, through faith, that we have been saved. And that is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. See, our salvation is a 100% gift of God. It's not a repayment for your goodness. We need to understand this. Otherwise, we'll get confused and frustrated in our walk with God. Because likewise... We, we deserve judgment. We deserve punishment, and yet God gives us grace. We are not entitled to a trouble-free life. We are not entitled to a coronavirus-free, financial hardship-free life. Demanding or even claiming these things reveals an alarming ignorance about the nature of God. See, God owes us nothing. He doesn't owe you an explanation of what He is doing. He doesn't owe us anything. Lousy theology claims that He does but that leads to bitterness, depression, and ultimately a broken life. And church, I have met many people who are frustrated and depressed and bitter at God because for some reason they think God owes them many things. Perhaps they, they've been watching too, many, too much uh, TV preachers who teach this garbage. And for that reason, they are broken in their spiritual life and they, they are bitter at everybody else. On the other hand... The biblical understanding of divine grace leads to joy unspeakable. It leads to spiritual maturity and creates in you a thankful heart because you realize you don't deserve any of this. You deserve to be dead and yet God gives you life. And God gives you uh, the, the, the opportunity to be a part of a church and the family. Everything you have is by divine grace. Furthermore, the correct understanding of this perfection will inspire you to be gracious towards others. Remember, He is the source and the standard of grace, as well as He is the source of the standard of every other um, divine perfection. According, therefore, to His self-disclosure, in the eternal present, God is not only spirit, He is love, He is good, He is faithful and gracious, and He is also compassionate. 
God is compassion. And in an outburst of praise, the psalmist writes, He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. That is in Psalm 111, verse 4. And again, he says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. And what this divine character trait describes as sympathy, the appropriation of someone else's trouble, followed by the desire to help. And we are familiar with this. And when we're talking about God's compassion, we're talking about the fact that he's motivated by his own nature to act. And motivated by his own essence, God looked at the spiritual condition of humanity and moved by compassion, he rescued sinners from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, according to Colossians 1.13. Again, motivated by nothing else than by his own essence and nature. And that's because his compassions never fail. The book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22, teaches us. Again, it's not because we're a good catch. It's not because we have something good to offer to God, but solely and exclusively because of his nature, which is compassionate. He reached down and saved us. Now, the entire book of Jonah clarifies and illustrates this truth. You may remember the story. The Ninevites uh, were uh, a very wicked people, and God commissioned Jonah to preach to them a message of judgment. But contrary to what Jonah expected, the Ninevites repented. The Ninevites repented at the preaching of the Word of God, and therefore the Lord spared their city because He is compassionate. He gave them mercy. And the sad irony is that the prophet of God uh, called to serve him full time and to preach the compassions of God was really upset with this and he thought that undeserving sinners did not uh, were not worthy of the compassions of God which is a half true statement but although he was happy to receive divine compassion for himself now Christ our sympathetic high priest gives us the clearest example of this divine perfection and practice. You will read in the Gospels, my friends, many instances where the author of the Gospels will say, Jesus moved by compassion or feeling compassion, he acted, or he, whether by feeding people or whether by uh, uh, talking with them or, or healing them. And this divine attribute moved him to endure the cross ultimately on behalf of undeserving sinners like you and me. And now, since God is the source and the standard of this, <coughs> excuse me, of this divine attribute, compassion, we can, how can we reproduce this virtue in human version? I'm glad you asked. Because I can't think of anything more compassionate than to tell people you need Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything more loving than this. Now, yes, people do need food. They need clothes. But the greatest need that people have is to hear the gospel because they are separated from God. And uh, they stand condemned unless they come to Jesus Christ. So secondarily, yes, feed them. Give them clothes. Give them a hug or whatever. Not now. You need, we need to be six feet apart. When this is all over, you can hug people. But in the meantime, what we need to be doing is in an act of compassion telling people how to be saved leading them to Jesus Christ because there's nothing more compassionate than to tell people I have a cure for your problem it's in right here in the Bible now think about this if you knew the cure for this problem that we're facing right now wouldn't you tell the whole world well, guess what, my friend? If you're a believer in Christ, you have the solution for the sin problem of the world. And that solution is called Jesus Christ. And the most compassionate thing you can do is to tell everybody how to be saved. Tell them the gospel. Tell them that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save them. Because we want to reproduce that divine perfection of compassion. Now, according to his self-disclosure, then, in the eternal present, God is not only spirit, he is love. He is good, He is faithful, and He is compassionate, and He is righteous. That's the last one here on my list. He is righteous. Now, according to the choir director, David said this in Psalm 11, verse 7, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold His face. And in praise format, he writes, The Lord is righteous in all of His ways and kind in all His deeds. And in a prayer of repentance on behalf of his people, Daniel said this in Daniel 9 verse 14. The Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done. But we have not obeyed his voice. See a prayer of confession and repentance on behalf of his own people here. 
but the righteousness of God, closely associated with holiness, which we will talk about next week. This perfection focuses on moral uprightness. And that we're talking about the moral morality of God. He is the source and standard of all morality, of all justice. Therefore, God legislates, He rules, and He judges according to His own nature. Not by referendum, not by majority, but by divine authority. Why? Because He is the source of this very perfection. Now, we need to understand this. People do not define right or wrong. People cannot vote what is right or what is wrong because God already determines that. He is the source of that very uh, perfection. The best we can do is acknowledge that and live by what He has defined as right or wrong. We don't define it. We can't vote right or wrong. He does. He has already defined it. Compliance with His laws produces rewards, obviously. Although He is not obligated to reward anyone, we just saw it. He does it because He's good, because He's gracious, because it's His nature to give. So He rewards compliance with His laws, with a, a, a good life. Good, I don't mean in a sense of prosperity life, but a, a good conscience, a life that you can put your head uh, and sleep at night saying, I am following God's will. I'm being upright in here because God is righteous. No matter the consequence, I'm going to do what's right. Whatever the consequence, even if it invites persecution, I'm going to do as, what is right. So he rewards um, compliance with his law. And, and, and uh, those of us who stand on the truth of God and we uphold the word of God. Now, on the other hand, rebellion invites punishment. Everything God decrees and determines highlights His moral purity. We need to understand this. Everything God decrees and permits and does and determines highlights His moral purity, His infinite wisdom and His perfect goodness, even when we don't understand His ways. Now, we don't need to understand anything He does because we couldn't anyway. Have you tried to understand the universe, something that God created? You don't understand it. It's hard for us to grasp the concept of the immensity of God's creation. And we're trying to send telescopes to, into space to try to understand that more. Now imagine the creator of all of that. Now, let me repeat this. Everything that God decrees, which includes suffering sometimes for your life, highlights His moral purity. His infinite wisdom and His perfect goodness, even when we don't understand it. Let me say this. God has never had and never will have an ethical dilemma. Let me repeat this. God never has never had and never will have an ethical dilemma, especially when He interrupts your plans and my plans. Now, I, being a pastor, I, I talk to people all the time, obviously, and I have seen all kinds of responses to divine interruption of personal projects. All kinds of ways people respond when things don't go their way. Let's put it this way. And perhaps the most common that I hear is the accusation of divine unfairness, which is alarmingly childish when people say God is not fair. I'm talking about grown-ups who, like perpetual teenagers, will cross their arms and say, talk back to God and say, it is not fair like a perpetual teenager. Now, let me remind us this, church. Divine fairness would take us all to hell. We don't want fairness because the Bible says uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Divine fairness will take us all to condemnation. Now, why? Because perfection is a requirement to go to heaven, to enter heaven. So we don't want fairness. We want grace. We need grace in order to make it to heaven. And God offers, thankfully, grace on the basis of faith, on the substitutionary death of Christ, which you can obtain right now if you're not in Christ. And that's the good news of the attributes of God. They're available right now. And you can receive the grace of God right now if you come to Jesus Christ. Remember, we don't want fairness. We want grace because fairness will condemn us all. Now, many of my friends, let me give you a personal example. Many of my friends struggle to make sense of the death of my son about 12 years ago. And I heard variations of the following statement. You're a pastor. You help people. You don't deserve this. This is not right. And perhaps you face the same struggle and you're saying today, Lord, this is not right. Uh, I'm in this crisis, and, and you, got all, you got this all wrong, Lord. I'm in this crisis. I don't deserve this. I'm one of your best servants. And friend, if that's the attitude of your heart, let me say this as pastorally and as loving as I can. Repent. Repent, 
because we are not in a position to put the righteous God of the universe on trial for his actions. It's the other way around. We don't put God on trial for his actions. We don't evaluate his actions. It's the other way around. We get to know that he is righteous, and that should be enough for us to know that God is righteous, and his righteousness is good. His goodness is love. His, love, uh, his, loving, his, his goodness is loving. His love is holy and so forth. And let me say this. The only innocent that God killed is named Jesus Christ. And he did it in your place in order to display his righteousness and love fully operating in harmony. Let me say this again. God has never killed an innocent man except for Jesus Christ. And he did it on your behalf in order to display his love and righteousness operating in full harmony for his glory and your joy and benefit. And Christ rose again to allow forgiven sinners to live forever. We can state this in biblical language just by quoting Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He, meaning God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is the righteous God of the universe and he is true. There's no lies in him, no unrighteousness in him. So according to his self-disclosure, what we looked at today, uh, some of his uh, perfections here, God is spirit, he's love, he's good, he's faithful, he's gracious, he's compassionate, and he is righteous. We will continue this, obviously, next week. We're going to talk about some of the non-communicable attributes of God. Uh, forgive the technical language. What I mean by that is to say that we're going to look at the perfections of God that people do not have. For example, you are not all-knowing. Did you know that? I, uh, some of you may be shocked to hear this. You are not all-knowing. <laughs> uh, God is. We're going to talk about the omnipresence of God. Uh, you, God is everywhere at the same time in the fullness of His being. There's no inch of the universe where God is not. And we're going to talk about this. And God is omnipotent. There is nothing that God cannot do that is a, uh, according to His nature. There are some things that God cannot do. For example, God cannot lie. God cannot sin because those things are not part of his nature. Now, God can do everything according to his nature, and that's the omnipotence of God. We're going to talk about the holiness of God. I'm giving you a preview of that, the fact that God is holy, 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 and he must punish sin. He must see to it that his holiness is proclaimed. Now, we're going to talk about some of this next week, but for now, let's just bask in the glory of God, and let's conclude with this. Each one of these perfections apply equally to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, we will study the triunity of God next week. But once again, let me reiterate that God is not a sum of these attributes. These attributes are found in full perfection in the person of God in His essence and nature. And they find their source and standard in Him. And um, therefore, we can rest in His glorious nature. And friends, many people have been asking during this time, what is God doing uh, with this crisis, with this global pandemic? And the right answer is this. We do not know what God is doing. We, we do not need to know what God is doing. All we need to know is to trust Him. All we need to know is to learn that He is righteous. So whatever He does is righteous. All we need to know is God is love. So whatever He's doing it is loving. All we need to know is that God is good and God is gracious. Whatever God is doing is all of these things because these are part of His nature. And that's all we need to know. Therefore, we rest on these promises. We don't need to worry. We don't need to lose sleep over what's going to happen tomorrow because what's going to happen tomorrow is part of God's um, uh, sovereign plan. By the way, sovereignty is another one of those attributes that we're going to talk about next week. And again, the hope um, in this is to... Uh, invite us all to draw near to God as we go through this, as we ride this wave that we have never seen before in the history of at least my lifetime and most of you, unless you're 100 years old and you were part of the Spanish flu pandemic. But uh, the, for the rest of us, this is a new normal that we're experiencing. What a great time to learn to trust God and to uh, just glory in His essence and in His nature without having to uh, demand an explanation from God. We're not in that position anyway. We shouldn't demand explanation from God for anything. All we need to do is to trust Him and He will take good care of you because He promised that. And we just learned that God is righteous and whatever He says comes to pass. And He promised to take care of us. 
Now, I want to conclude by saying this to those of you who are not in Christ. If you are listening to this and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't mean you know about Jesus Christ. What I mean is that you have not yet turned your life over to Him by coming to Him in uh, faith and repentance and turning from your sin and turning to Him. Today is the day to do that. I can't think of a better time for you than to trust Jesus Christ during this time and His work on the cross and trust His work on the cross to get you to heaven. And He will make you a new person. In fact, He promised in His Word that He will not turn anybody away who comes to Him in repentance and faith. So I want to invite you to do that. And you can reach out to us, info at gbcsalem.org, if you made that decision. Again, info at gbcsalem.org we'll, we'll, we'll uh, recommend a local church for you if you're not in the area here and uh, we, we just want to know that if you made that decision we want to rejoice with you but let's, uh, the rest of us let's pray together now as we close Father thank you for today and yet another opportunity Lord to worship you to proclaim your goodness Lord by talking about the attributes of God Lord and I confess my limitation Lord and my sinfulness, my, my, my unclean lips, Lord, are trying to explain the holy God, the God who's all good, all knowing, all perfect, Lord. And here I am, a mere man, trying to explain all of that from the Word. Lord, have mercy on me, Father. And, uh, and the rest of us, we're trying to understand uh, your nature, Lord. So give us a mature understanding of your essence, Lord, so that we can grow in maturity, so that we can grow in Christ's likeness, Lord, and, 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 and get to know you, Lord, and, and our joy will be unspeakable. We will experience the joy of the Lord just by getting to know your character, Lord. And those uh, who are listening to this who are still struggling for whatever reason, Lord, whether for the, the politics of all of this or the, 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 still the, the risks of getting infected, Lord, give them an extra measure of your grace, Lord, your enabling grace, Father, and the peace that surpasses all understanding, Father. And if there's anyone who is listening to this who is not yet a follower, of, a born-again follower of Christ, Lord, will you um, soften their hearts today, Lord, to hear the gospel and to come to a saving knowledge of Christ, Lord, that, that's our prayer, and we know that this is within your will because um, you commanded us to preach the gospel and make disciples of every nation, Lord. So you're more interested in this than we are, and we take great comfort of, in that, Lord. Bless Grace Baptist Church, Lord, as we ride this wave, as we uh, try to weather this storm, Lord, and thank you that we've been able to adapt, Lord, and we're, we're looking forward to our, our in-person fellowship because that is what we're supposed to do. You've called us to assemble together. To, to worship you, Lord. But we gladly give up that right in the, in the meantime, that privilege in the meantime, in order to protect others, Lord, and to honor uh, our government and to honor uh, your word, Lord. And uh, we're not in a hurry, although we are eager, Father, to come together again just to see each other, Lord. We'll, we'll have to withhold the handshaking and all of that, but we're, we'll, we'll do that gladly, Father. And in, in, in the meantime, in the remaining weeks or months, however long you have, Lord, give us the enabling grace to continue to serve you with all excellence and um, sincerity of heart and to serve your flock as well, Lord, because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.